Hey folks, it's bonus episode time. This is an encore interview with film composer Anthony Willis. Anthony scored Emerald Fennell's drama thriller Promising Young Woman, which premiered at Sundance last year. I sat down with Anthony in Park City after the premiere and talked to him about his creative process and what it was like scoring the film. One of the intriguing and exciting things about seeing films at Sundance is not knowing if the film you're seeing will ever be picked up for distribution. But with Promising Young Woman, I knew it was a matter of when, not if, it would hit theaters nationwide. So as soon as I heard this film was making its theatrical debut, on streaming services of course, due to the pandemic, I knew I had to relaunch Anthony's episode and get the word out about this powerful and important film. So let's jump into my interview with film composer Anthony Willis, the way it originally aired, in its entirety. I promise there are no spoilers, so feel free to listen before you see the film. Your job as a composer for, I think, 99.9% of films, and I'm only saying that just because there may be an exception, is to create an authority to the film. So you're creating a sound that helps the audience to engage in the film and the tone of the film that they're watching and helps them believe in it and helps set up a logic to which that experience is going to unfold in front of them. Um, and of course, within that, there's all sorts of things one does to to play with that or mislead the audience or, you know, but essentially you're, you're giving them permission to feel things, which without the score, they'd be left, left feeling a bit dry emotionally. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Anthony Willis is on the show today. Anthony is a film composer who scored the film Promising Young Woman with Carrie Mulligan, Bo Burnham, Laverne Cox, and Alison Brie. Written and directed by Emerald Fennell, Promising Young Woman premiered at Sundance this year, which is where I had the good fortune to sit down with Anthony for this interview. Without giving the plot away, I can tell you that Promising Young Woman crosses between genres multiple times. Just when you think you're settling into a drama, you laugh and think it's a comedy. Just when you think you're watching a comedy, it turns dark, very dark. But when the movie makes you feel uncomfortable, it's not due to the capriciousness of the writer-director. It's because the story and the theme of the film demand that the audience feel that discomfort. In this interview, Anthony and I talk about this dynamic in the film, as well as his work in the How to Train Your Dragon movies from DreamWorks Studios, Despicable Me 2, Solo, A Star Wars Story, and Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. We also talk about his scoring work on video games, like Fortnite. I knew very little about film scoring going into this interview but came away with a new respect for the contributions made by film composers to the tone and feel of films and video games. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with film composer Anthony Willis. Anthony Willis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Brian, so much for having me. And uh, can you tell us what brings you to Sundance? So I'm here to support the uh, film Promising Young Woman, directed by Emerald Fennell, uh, and I was lucky enough to compose the score for the movie. How did you get involved with that project? I've known Emerald. Um, she's been in my life a long time because we actually, funny enough, were at high school together in England. Um, she was a very impressive actress at the time in all the school plays. So I've been aware of Emerald as a force of nature for a long time. Uh, and she, right when she was finishing uh, shooting the film, she was looking for a composer, which is obviously a really challenging decision, especially for a film that's as unique as this one. Uh, and really, I just wanted to give her some advice. Um, but she very sweetly, you know, invited me to watch the film and, and write a demo and sort of see if, you know, really, I was just there to be a resource to help her, you know, have a perspective on how the music could be, if I were doing it, or if somebody like me were doing it. And I was so inspired by Carrie, uh, Carrie Mulligan's performance and the character and the journey that, of the character she plays, Cassie, in the movie. And I spoke to the music supervisor as well, and we sort of tried to see if we could find a theme that would actually, you know, bind the movie together because it does it does move through quite a few genres. And that was really cool that she sort of steered me to that. And I wrote one, and Emerald loved it, and and that was that. So it, that that's an interesting coincidence that you grew up around the, the filmmaker, I mean, around the, the director. 
Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I mean, England is so horribly cliquey and and no, it's a small country. You know, I mean, people people overlap. There's a lot of overlap, but that's also a wonderful thing about certainly the the film community in general, uh, especially in in England. But but uh, you know, and everybody out who then moves to LA gets to know each other, and you know, everybody's there to support each other and you know help each other out. So yeah, I'm really lucky to be you know part of that and part of that that friendship group. Was there a, an art school that you went to in England or a, just a regular high school? I was a, well, I started music when I was very young. I was a chorister. Um, I don't know if you know in England, there's a, it's a longstanding chorister tradition. Well, when you were sort of eight years old, you're sent off to boarding school to sing in these beautiful cathedrals, or in my case, St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. And it was the most incredible training. I mean, it, I was just kind of immersed in, in some of the world's most beautiful choral music for, you know, day on, day, uh, you know, day in, day out. Uh, and that really rubbed off on me. And then when I went to my next school, which was Marlborough, um, I sort of, you know, wanted to start writing my own music. And at what age were you um, when you wanted to do, do that? Uh, I was thirteen. Oh wow! Um, and you know, I wrote some music for the school plays, and it was an amazing school. And I had, a, you know, I was a music scholar, and um, so I had access to these amazing facilities. And and then I then went on to study uh, music at the University of Bristol. Which is a really cool city. I mean, it's it's very vibrant, and there's a huge music scene there. A lot of dubstep came out of there, but it's also you can look if you look past the buildings, you can see, you know, you can see cows in the fields. It's a very sort of rural city as well. It's a beautiful place to study. And then right after that, I went to USC to the film scoring program. Not well, actually, that's not quite true. I took a year to desperately save up money and uh, moved back in with my parents and taught piano and took any job I could to, to save up to go to USC. Uh, and that was really valuable because it, it got me in it to LA uh, and it got me you know into the heart of the, I wouldn't say the heart of the film music business, but certainly the access that program has to alumni. Oh yeah. Is being, you know, really great. So that's sort of the heart of the industry right there. Yes. Very much. USC and all the people I, I, I've heard that it's one of the most difficult film schools to get into in any of those programs. Yeah, no, it's 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 tough, um, and I mean, yeah, the film, the new film school that they they opened a couple of years ago is the uh, Lucas School is absolutely insane. Well, yeah, Spielberg Lucas School, I think it is, is incredibly grand. It looks like a sort of Spanish film set, and we, we were kind of in the basement there, you know, which is a fairly accurate model for what the life is like as a composer in the business. Yeah. So but let's yeah. go. Let's go back to age eight and the boarding school. But that that sounds like a pretty unique trajectory for a young child i don't know hardly anybody who has been to boarding school at age eight but it sounds like that's kind of a normal thing for people in your town or your area who have musical skills and might be musical prodigies i think it's becoming less normal i mean i think it's quite a yeah it's quite a thing to you know to, to go leave your parents age eight and certainly it was it was overwhelming but it was also this incredible adventure i mean the school was um situated in the foothills of windsor castle you know and when you were senior enough as a as a chorister you'd have a key you know to go up and in a castle yeah yeah windsor castle which is it's almost um, like hogwarts <laughs> it's uh it's definitely one of the most interesting castles in in england i mean it was um yeah henry the eighth is buried there i'd walk over his grave every day and, oh my goodness um it was um yeah it was a phenomenal it was an amazing adventure i mean we'd you know we'd like play hide and seek on the banks of the castle which are these steep we weren't supposed to but we did and you know it was a huge amount of history and um it was it was really really cool yeah very unique place to go to school for sure now looking back putting yourself in your uh your eight-year-old shoes at the time did you know how special and unique that was to get a boarding school immersion experience like that at such a young age i think i did i mean i think you you pull up you can take the train to windsor from london it takes about 20 minutes and as you roll in you see this huge castle ahead of you and in fact the castle is very much situated it sort of has its butt sticking right into the town and the town sort of wraps around it. And then it, it then goes on to expand out into these beautiful parklands um, where, in fact, our, our playing fields were, where we played football and cricket. God, that sounds so pompous. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it was, it was pretty obvious to me that it was a pretty special place. And, you know, I mean, the, I mean, it's funny with everything that's going on right now with the royal family and all of that press. But, you know, we were singing quite regularly at those events for them. So it was 
you had this sense of there was a huge uh, sense of ceremony to everything. I think, I mean, the big reaction I had having left was that my my time was so intense, and you know, the fear of waking up with a sore throat and not being able to sing, or it was quite. I think it certainly prepared me for the pressure of Hollywood. I think, but the reaction I sort of had after that was suddenly then going on to a school where I had a lot of time to myself, and that was when I was like, "Wow, I can really like I actually can have time to write some music." And that was University but, of Bristol, or was that earlier? Or even yeah, yeah. at Marlborough, you know. Um, so you know, whereas I think you probably had about twenty minutes yourself in the day. You know, get up, practice instrument one, go and sing for an hour, go to lessons, go to sport. You know, practice instrument two go and prepare for the service that it was very intense routine for it for an eight-year-old for sure yeah and what was your goal in high school college and and then in film scoring school at usc in terms of the types of instruments that you wanted to at least become competent in if not master to be good at your craft and i was lucky my parents i was a i was a pretty reluctant pianist when i was younger they started me very early and really, you know, at Windsor, I had the environment to, you know, there were pianos everywhere and practice rooms everywhere. And we were, you know, we had it scheduled into our day. And that was really where I really took off with my instruments. And I remember going to see, um, this is a really cheesy story, but I remember going to see Titanic. And I mean, there, a lot of these kids at the school were like, they had parents who were musicians or, or um, yeah, my parents are music lovers, but they're not professional musicians by any, by any means. And um you know, the, these kids would be proficient, like grade eight and two instruments at age 11. And I was, I was good, but I was certainly behind. But what I realized when I went to see Titanic is I came back and I sat down on the piano and I played the, I played James Horner's theme. I think my parents were like, oh, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting. And even my peers at Windsor, they were really good readers. And of course their ears were brilliant too, but I think that was just something that I'd, I sort of discovered. And that's what really ignited the sort of the anatomy of music, understanding the anatomy of harmony, knowing how you can make it, how you can inject emotion into things. So the film score for Titanic, it sounds like was pretty influential for you. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that stylistically it was something I would, I mean, of course, with greatest respect to James Horner, he's one of the most wonderful composers we've ever had. And certainly, I mean, his, his scores to brave heart and beautiful mind are some of my real favorites, but I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that the Titanic specifically influenced me, but it but it sort of was a moment that I realized that I could it was a way into the anatomy of of a of a good piece of music. So tell us about the transition from film school at USC into the professional world where you're actually working on real film projects and are in the industry and are sought after now. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely I, I wish I could meet myself from fifteen years ago and and I'd probably give myself a slap and be like, you realize how lucky you are. You've, you, I mean, I never dreamed I'd get this far. I think that's how we all approach these things. Everybody knows how competitive the business is and you just take each thing as it comes and try and do your best. You can't determine so many of the, the opportunities that you just hope that they come and you, you know, you put your love into the music and you do your best writing and then that speaks for you. But uh, yeah, I mean, at USC, we had a really fantastic seminar with Harry Gregson Williams, who's who I'd been aware of for a long time because he'd actually taught my sister's music in a children's opera in Holland Park in London, which actually Michael Kamen was also involved in. So I think my first sort of awareness of film composers came from my sisters doing this uh, children's opera. Hmm. And then when you were in film school, were the connections sort of fed to you through the alumni of the school kind of reaching out to upcoming graduates and kind of pulling you into projects as perhaps uh, in a mentor mentee relationship or how, how did that transition into a professional career from USC to where you're at now? Yes. I mean, there was a lot of contact with alumni um, and a lot of these sort of seminars. So sorry. So with Harry, um, you know, he had us over to his studio and I, because I've been aware of him, I was like, and I really loved his Shrek score and I really loved his scores in general. I was thinking, I've got a, I've got an L. So if I can't, there's, there's those moments in your life where you, it's, it's a self-imposed challenge. Nobody's telling you, if you don't do this, you won't get this. But it's something that's looking you squarely in the eyes and you're saying, if I can't impress Harry or do something good for Harry, then he, then I clearly, it's a barometer of, of where you should be pushing yourself and your own expectations for yourself. 
So needless to say, I set up for three days on something that I'd probably now consider quite easy. But I, you know, I think he gave us a cue from Shrek to read here. And he gave us um, a couple of cues from a f- film called 12, which is, a, I think, a Joel Schumacher movie. And, you know, and then he invited me to intern for him. And so I sort of, you know, got to know him and he was very supportive. He then, in fact, went back to England. And so I went to work at Remote Control. Um, the other thing I'll add about USC is there was an internship with John Powell that was assigned in the first week. And it was assigned literally uh, the first week of our school. And I remember thinking, oh, gosh, like, I wish I'd had a shot at that. I love when his How to Train a Dragon score had just come out. I remember thinking, oh, man, like, wh- why did the program director not, like, give us a test or give us a chance to, you know, how did he make this decision? And then I started to hear, of course, you know, poor person in the internships getting no contact with John and, and is sort of <laughs> doing something fairly medial. And not that that's not an, an important aspect of getting into the business. But anyway, come full circle, I eventually, having worked remote, uh, got introduced to John. And it's funny how life is. I mean, had I perhaps had I got that internship, I would never have been able to have John look at me as a potential composer. Whereas by the time I'd actually met him, I'd already written additional music on Despicable Me too which was a um, Illumination Entertainment movie, which he'd done, of course, The Lorax. So he, you know, I think it was a sort of rite of passage. So when I met him, he, you know, he viewed me as as somebody who could help him uh, in in a musical way, as opposed to (laughs) somebody who'd cut samples. So it's funny how life is like that. And it's so much about timing. And then it's so much about when you get the opportunity, just not letting go and making sure you do everything you can to do the job as well as you can. So timing, luck, Obviously, luck is a component, I think, for everybody in this industry, but also being able to recognize the opportunity when it's in front of you and knowing how to capitalize on on that opportunity. Yeah, and a lot of tenacity, I think. I mean, you know, being being the one who wants to stay there late to find the best way of doing that arrangement, finding the best harmony for this, finding the best counterpoint. I mean, just not letting go until you until, you know, you feel like you, you don't know how else to do it. So how did you get involved with Despicable Me 2? So after um, after interning with Harry, he actually decided to go back to, to England to um, to do a sabbatical and teach cricket. And I think, I mean, he really loved that. And he'd been working, he'd been kind of going full blast in Hollywood for the best part of 20 years. And and he was invited to do this. And he said, I'm so sorry, I was going to have you come on, but I'm, I'm winding down my whole operation. And in fact, he, he let go of the studio he had in Venice Beach. Um, so I thought, oh gosh, I better get another job. And somebody called me to go to remote, and uh, I started doing arrangements and additional music for Hato Pereira. Um, he's a wonderful uh, guitarist who came up also under Hans, and um, and then you know subsequently composed his own movies. And so I was a part of that movie. It was really fun. Then you know after that, I th- I sort of think I th- I felt that I had more to give as a composer and an, uh, an arranger um, in in a sort of you know different styles. And so when I met John, you know, I, I certainly didn't um, didn't hesitate. Yeah. Well, I mean, these are really popular, great films that are iconic and are going to be they are going to live on for decades. Right. And uh, how does it feel to be a part of those projects? It's. I mean, it's wonderful, and it's it's really wonderful for younger composers that there's a structure that really Han started. Um, you know, I think traditionally support composers or what's called additional music composers were orchestrators, you know, in the, in the old Hollywood model. And with the technology of having to do demos and, you know, have everything mocked up and everything within the computer, that role of orchestrators transitioned into the additional music composers. And, you know, that's something that Hans very much started and everyone who's worked and come up under him has sort of followed a similar model. And, you know, with deadlines and changing schedules and all these things, it's, it's great to, I mean, to really... 70 pieces of music in a in a film i mean you know to have the support of arrangers and other composers is a is a very necessary thing on these high high budget movies so it's a wonderful i mean it's wonderful to get that experience i think i'd really encourage young composers to do that i mean you know of course there's a narrative of oh you know you're getting screwed or you're getting not you're not getting the full credit and all these things but honestly i mean if you if you compare it to most businesses you know, whether it's a law firm or a finance firm, every firm has that structure. I think the confusion in Hollywood is that because the credits music by, it, the the assumption is is that that person is doing every single possible task related to delivering the score, which just isn't practical, and and also isn't isn't reasonable for 
people at the top of their game who've been working for 30 years. And so, you know, I ne- and I mean, on a from a creative point of view, you're getting the chance to work with a film that you'd never be, you'd never be on age 25, you know, on your own. And so when you then get the breaks, your own breaks, you have the confidence to approach them because you've, you've lived through, you've been in, flying the wall with these huge directors. So, you know, it's, it's been an essential part of my training and it sort of prepares you for battle for what's to come. So tell us what a, a film composer or scorer does for, for listeners who really don't know the full scope of responsibilities of what you do uh, working on a film like Despicable Me or How to Train Your Dragon or the more, more recently Promising Young Woman? Your, your job as a composer for, I think, 99.9% of the films, and I'm only saying that just because there may be an exception, is to create an authority to the film. So you're creating a sound that helps the audience to engage in the film and the tone of the film that they're watching and helps them believe in it and helps set up a logic to which that experience is going to unfold in front of them. Um, and of course, within that, there's all sorts of things one does to, to play with that or mislead the audience. Or, you know, but essentially, you're, you're giving them permission to feel things, which without the score, they'd be left, left feeling a bit dry emotionally. Yeah. Well, the, um, the reason I ask that is that I, I hear in movies, and I, I heard this with well, almost every film that I see, there's a mix of composition you know orchestral or piano you know sort of film the traditional film score sounds and then actual songs from right bands so how does how does that work in terms of do you have like a producer or a director that's telling you all right this scene don't worry about it because it's either going to be silent or you're not or we're going to have a song that we get the rights to or are you doing a score for the entire thing and then you're letting the director cut out certain sections and insert um, songs. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think there's no greater authority, and go back to what I, what I was just talking about, this idea of giving the film authority. There's no greater authority than a song because it's something that, especially if it's a famous song, so it's something that you hear and it, and it floods the film with um, a mythology. As long as it's well chosen. I mean, obviously, if, it, if, it, if it's a jarring choice, which also actually can be effective in its own way. If it's a jarring choice against the narrative, then it might countermand that. So a piece of music that you already know has a very different effect dramatically than something, than a score. And obviously a score can be much more versatile. It can be song-ish in style and in intensity. But a score, you know, a score is much more versatile. It can be extremely subtle. It can be, ex- it can, you know, I mean, of course, it won't have lyrics, which is obviously useful for, for dialogue, although of course you can in songs you can mute the vocals and things like that and do edits. Um, but no, I mean every project, you know, normally it's been tempted with the songs. You know, the the I mean, you know, a great director and editor will design the film in such a way that they've already planned. Okay, we want this is a song moment, and you know that that's going to be really good for the film. It's going to, you know, it, as I said, the song will have a different feeling than a score piece. Um, and then, you know, you spot the film and yeah, you absolutely, that's, that stuff has been workshopped normally before you're involved through the edit. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, but you know, that's always something that I think when you come onto the project, you should, you know, challenge those things too, for, to yourself, <laughs> to yourself first right. before, before like sticking your hand up and saying, oh, I think you should do this. But it's, you know, it's, it's always a work in progress, that balance of how much score do you have? What does it really need to do? You know, and obviously editors are, are amazing partners in in that. You know, especially with you know newer directors who who are sort of trying to you know figure out where they want music and where music's needed. So it sounds like when you get the the film, you're you're actually seeing a fairly complete film that just does not have. It may have the music, the the songs already picked by the director and placed in certain scenes, um, but your job is to fill in the gaps tonally and to create that permission as you said for people to believe and feel certain things that the director really is looking for is is that a fair statement yeah i mean i think you know as part of the edit you know they'll also tamp in existing film music to again for their own workshopping of the scenes to see how the scenes are responding so 
you know, in most films you'll receive, sometimes you come on with a rough, very rough edit, um, which I think is great because you can start to chip away. You don't have to score the whole thing at once, but you can start to find what the most important emotional anchors for the score are going to be. Um, and then when you get a fairly locked cut, you'll, it will have temp in it. And sometimes the director will be really attached to the temp score. Uh, and sometimes th- they won't. And, you know, it's it's a useful tool for sure. There's a huge debate about temps, you know, whether they... Because they can, they can cause problems because you... If a director's... They've really fallen in love with how a scene feels with a certain piece of music, it can be really hard to get them to, to, uh, to fall in love again. Yeah. As you may have noticed, there are great resources and advice mentioned in all our episodes. And for many of them, we actually collect all of these resources for you in one easy place, our newsletter. You can go to dreampathpod.com slash newsletter to join. It's not fancy, just an email about each week's episode, featured artists, and resources to help you on your journey. Thanks. And now back to the interview. One observation I made uh, during A Promising Young Woman and, and during other films that I've seen during the festival as well is that the distinct comedic moments where there's like a scene that is designed to be funny there's almost no music or score of any kind is that your experience is that those those scenes that are designed to get laughs that they're kind of clean that way yeah i think that's a good observation i mean that can yeah i mean you know in classic animation uh, there's a there's a trick which is that you know music's going 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 music stops there's a joke and that's a very clear way of sort of pulling the needle off the off the record to make space for that joke and it, and again it's it's clearly articulating it whereas i think if you have score ongoing psychologically you have something that could be very funny and then i mean of course there's there's comedy music too there's music that can be funny and there's music that can be make things funnier because it's ironic so something that's supposed to be funny but it's being played with very dangerous music um like a parody you know certainly like seth rogan's movies what was the movie that he made in uh, in uh, North Korea? Mm, the Netflix film, right? Yeah, and you know, it, huh? The interview. Yeah, the interview. So it's like <laughs> it, 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 So a film like that, you would do. You don't want to suddenly go. Oh, let's do funny music because it's trying to be funny. You actually counterbalance it by making it really serious and imperial. Yeah. You know, for for um, Kim Jong Il's character. So. You know, in promising young woman, yeah, I think it, I think you know we we stayed away from from having too much some of the more sinister horror score because it would I think it would it creates a vapor that the audience are thinking, well, hang on, is this supposed to be really scary or or not? So yeah, I mean that's that's true, and yeah. and it's amazing how Emerald balances this incredible subject matter with so much humor, yeah, at some of the darkest moments. Well, you know, one thing I noticed about promising young woman. I saw it uh, at the premiere, I think, or I saw it at the Ray a couple days ago. I'm not sure if that was the premiere, but did you say it in the morning? It was, yeah, it was in the morning. Yeah. The premiere was the night before oh, okay. Saturday night. Yeah. I but, guess I missed the premiere. Um, but I, I noticed that there were, you talked about the, the different genres that it crossed over mm-hmm. and I, I was first, I'm thinking this is a comedy and then I'm thinking, holy shit, this is a really dark comedy. And then I'm thinking, okay, this is full on someone dealing with PTSD drama. Right. You know, and then, and then I'm at a certain point in the film, I'm thinking this is like a thriller. Right. Yeah. So what were the challenges? And I, I'm not, I'm trying not to give too much away about the film because there's, there's a lot that um, I think you just need to go in with no expectations on this movie. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And I think Emerald will very much appreciate that because it's very much an experience. It's a it's a it's a really cool linear experience that like, yeah, you you, you want to see it unfold. You don't want to have you don't want to know what's going to happen. Right, and especially with someone attached to the film like Carrie Mulligan, and, and she brings with her a lot of gravitas in terms of heavy drama. Not not a big comedic actor that that I've seen in her filmography, but you you come with ex- expectations about who is in the film. And, and then you see, oh, it's Bo Burnham is in there as well. So you think, okay, maybe there's a chance this could be a comedy. And, and those expectations were just blown out of the water about every 20 minutes in this movie. And it was a yes. wild, pretty wild ride. I think Emerald was very clever in her casting in specifically 
choosing actors that did have those associations yeah. so so that she was you know she's playing with us all you know starting with adam brody he's one of the most likable you know actors uh, and friendliest characters you know seth from the oc in our you know in our culture and that's exactly what she's trying to do is show you something you're used to seeing and then show you kind of show you the hidden camera mm -hmm. you know in those early those early uh kissing scenes where you're you're sort of going okay well you can see the perspective of of the men that she's with but you're actually you're also seeing the camera from the side and mm -hmm. you're seeing what's really going on and that you know with the music is, is a big part of it too because emerald really wanted to play with the audience and you know lead them down certain roads oh am i in a horror movie you know of course and then at the you know so the first cue the very first cue is a, is a full-on horror horror cue and then it cracks into its raining man and uh gosh i'm giving things away but <laughs> not a little bit everyone knows about raining man um <laughs> you know and she has a hot dog and it's it's like well is you see you see sort of blood the, the blood yeah blood, and it's like did something happen or is, and then of course it's uh, so that is very much something that she's um she's she's playing with us all mm -hmm. pushing us and you know in the, in the in the horror moments and then equally in the very romantic moments she's showing us there's this perspective which is you know how the world expected to be where everything's okay right so how closely are you working with the director when you sit down with your i assume you have a you know a digital keyboard of some kind that has the ability to play standard you know piano pieces but also get into you know violin and all of the things that keyboards do these days and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm stating anything wrong. No, you're but, completely right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're sitting at a keyboard and you've got the unscored film in front of you and you're, you're watching it. You're listening to the dialogue. How closely are you working with the director, if at all, for that first draft? We are sort of, I, I would guess that there's a stream of consciousness aspect to your approach to that. I think you definitely need, you need both things. You need that time with the door locked <laughs> nobody nobody in there and that you can try things out and you can i i think every composer in the world would dread to see that recorded just because it's that moment of vulnerability where you want to you want to try things out and you want to see you want you want to be able to dare and not feel like somebody's watching you and therefore have to modify what you're doing to be some kind of finished product yeah that said especially on a film like this with emerald she really was incredibly supportive and helpful coming to the studio and getting into the anatomy of the music and mm. saying oh can we just have piano here and oh can we you know i really want string i want a string thriller score because it was i mean there was a whole conversation we had early on about because of all the pop songs in the score and because of um it has been mentioned um the featuring of toxic which i, which I did an arrangement of for the near the end of the movie there was this sort of question of well should the score be a sort of version of mangled pop and I think Emerald felt that she really wanted the score to live in its own headspace and, you know, tonally and, and to support this sort of old school thriller feel. So it's, it's, it's really a classic thriller with a sort of contemporary twist, I think, overall the score. And obviously some very romantic moments and some very horrific moments. But no, she really was an integral part of being there and steering me. And, you know, I would, she'd say, oh, no, play the thing, get the, get the strings up, play the thing, just play the theme for the strings, uh, you know, on the strings. Yeah, that's great. Let's go let's send that to the producers. And I'm going, oh, oh, hang on a second, Emerald. I've got to make this like, you know, worthy so that, you know, as an MP3 and, you know, everyone in there, every intern and their mother has an opinion when these things go out. So you, there's a difference between the kind of controlled environment of the studio and then actually a, a track going out to, to people and, and not, you know, you not being able to speak for it. But no, she was a huge part of that, which isn't always the case. I mean, obviously on a lot of films, you'll write the score and it's expected that you're translating the emotions and actually the technical maneuverings of the music is that's that's your that's your job as the head of the department to determine but you know i mean emerald is she's sort of such an all-rounder in life and in in her work mm -hmm. you know she's an author she's an actor she's a you know she's a she's just written the uh, the book for the andrew lloyd webber's new cinderella um musical so she's I think I think it's impossible for her to not be want to get under the hood. Yeah, and I, and I really respect that, and it's really fun. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's her film, and you want her to you want her to, to to understand what's going on in the score. When you were seeing the scenes for the first time, which 
at, toward the beginning, there's some, I, I would call them love scenes, uh, just to make it easy, but they're, it's more complicated than that for sure. Right. Um, but the, uh, the awkwardness and the extreme discomfort that I think the audience feels, or at least I felt from not really knowing how dark this situation is, you know, not knowing where it's going. What, how did you deal with that as a film score and, and how did you approach the mu the, the music or the film score to those particular scenes? I think that the very, the very first one of those, I mean, we waited as long as we possibly could before the music comes in, because if it were the kind of romantic scene that you were describing, the music probably would come in or something. Oh, you'd normally have a needle drop song that reassures you that this romance is consensual you know, and then it would cut to the next scene or mm -hmm. show you a sex scene or something. Whereas in this case, it's all about reveling in that awkwardness. Mm -hmm. And only when things become, only only as, as Cassie as a character actually reveals her hand, does the score start to unfold mm -hmm. in those scenes. Yeah, one of the things I think Emerald is great at is making the audience feel like, should I be laughing here? Like, holy shit, I just laughed at that scene. And, and then you're sort of, forensically going back and going, mm, I shouldn't have laughed at that because <laughs> it's just, you don't know, like I said, you just don't know how dark and wrong it is until after you're in it and you're trying to navigate your way through the emotions. And that's what was so profound. I think about the experience from an audience standpoint. Yeah. I mean, I think she's trying to show us all a mirror uh, of us, you know, of ourselves. I think we've all interacted or known or been the people in that film on some level and you know especially i think especially the characters that are sort of the the innocent bystanders in in big right. <laughs> inverted commas right and i think that that's the the message that she really hits home throughout the movie and especially towards the end mm -hmm. that that um so yeah i mean i think it it certainly is a as a male i felt very unco uncomfortable the first time i saw the movie in i mean in a fantastic way because it, as i said it's it's shining this big mirror on everybody and 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 drawing us to question um, yeah. our perspective yeah absolutely necessary culturally necessary yes. to do that so um i see in your filmography that you have some video game work as well yes yeah how, how did you get involved in in video game scoring if that's what you call it i mean i think you know video game video game music and television music in general, especially in the last 10 years, has, has really, has become very close to film scores in terms of the kind of production value and dramatic and emotional qualities that, that they're trying to achieve through their games and TV shows. And, you know, so developers of those games look for Hollywood composers to come on board. Yeah, I, I scored an act two, which was a PlayStation game. Um, it was really fun, really fun adventure game. And, you know, they were looking for more of an animated Pixar score. And because I'd, I'd come from a lot of animated movies, they, um, you know, they, they wanted that sort of touch on the score. And that's how I got involved. And wh what do you prefer in terms of film versus video games or other types of music performance? Which way are you leaning professionally these days? Honestly, I'm lucky to be, uh, I, I count myself really lucky to do this for a living at all. So, I mean, I'm, you know, really interested in both. I, they both have they both have their perks. I mean, the film obviously has a wonderful structure and narrative and sh you know shape to it that that I find really intriguing. You know, where do you establish a theme? Where do you hit ideas home in the context of a film? Obviously, a video game doesn't have that linear experience. It's much more expansive, which is fun too. You know, you can't quite control how the audience are going to experience the music. And because um, they, they're determining it based on their environment a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, I mean, it's really fun. You're, you're often a, a big aspect of video game music is that you're, you're trying to provide energy for the game. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, there's an opportunity to write modular tracks, which, you know, possibly they rely less on harmonic changes, but more on like, you know, instrumental and, and modular groove based changes. So, you know, on that, we did a lot of, you know, African um, percussion and, you know, interest, like interesting elements that you could put the same, you could put the same tonal shape on or not, and it would still work. You know, obviously modulation and, and harmony is difficult to mesh. If you, <laughs> you suddenly want to put two ideas on top of each other, they won't work well, whereas percussion is much more, um, is much more malleable. 
Are you working with a director in a video game context or what is the name of the, your boss in a video game? Um, you can, it, it really depends on the game. I mean, often there's an audio team, a very strong audio team who, you know, at PlayStation, they'll be, they'll be the ones that actually are implementing the music into the game in terms of how they want it to work. So they'll ask you to write a piece a certain way. And, um, yeah, they, they're, they're often, you know, music producers essentially. Yeah who you work with so um in, in the case of knack 2 that was uh, that was who i worked with predominantly but then of course the director of the game is a director of a video game is is a lot more involved in some of the programming and coding aspects often and in terms of actually how the game is going to work so you know the, the creative music aspects will often be handled by the the audio directors but it, it depends on the game it depends on the company what are some of the the biggest challenges that you face from the standpoint of the business aspects of your job in terms of like getting paid, making sure you're treated fairly, making sure that you are considered for future projects with other studios, getting the appropriate credit, you know, are there, are there challenges that jump out at you that are just really frustrating and, and difficult to navigate? I think, yeah, I think everyone in life has, has their frustrations and, you know, and also their, their huge moments of like, wow, this is amazing. I can't believe I'm getting to do this. Hopefully, I hope we all feel that because that's, I think everyone deserves that. I, um, any kind of freelance situation for anybody is, is complicated because you're, you, you can't determine schedules, you know, they'll come in and then they'll change and you have to adapt. You know, much like any service industry, you have to accommodate your client or, or not. And that, that pressure to succeed is, is hard. You know, it's not, it's not for the faint of heart for sure. And it's something you get better at as you do it more. And it's something you, you know, as you, as you become more successful, you get, you do get paid better and you get bigger budgets and it's easier to deliver at a higher level. It's very hard to deliver at a high level on, on lower budget productions because you have to go above and beyond to, you know, really make every, every dollar go as far as it can. But, you know, equally not every project needs a symphony orchestra, you know, not there's, there's creative ways of breathing life and emotion into things that don't cost a lot of money. And so it's just finding that what's that balance of what's going to make the director really happy and what are they going to love? What's going to make their movie fantastic without costing them half a million dollars to produce that? I think that that can be, that can be frustrating when you're trying to achieve something and you're, you're limited in terms of budget as you know, we're in a time of more and more content and pro but probably for slightly lower budgets than has, you know, has been in the past. So this going to the symphony orchestra reference that you made, are, are those usually reserved for the Pixar studios pictures where you have the budget to bring in an entire orchestra and the, the other projects, maybe the Indies, you're kind of doing that yourself with your, your own uh, instruments. Yeah. I mean, it, definitely. I mean, you know, DreamWorks animation and Pixar are, are known for their fantastic scores and Disney animation. And, you know, those budgets are allocated early on as they have been for many years. I suppose it, I mean, it really depends what, what you need. I mean, there's lower, there's lower budget orchestra options, you know, so you can record in Eastern Europe and you could, there's lots of other ways of doing it. And, but yes, I mean, typically you find yourself very fortunate if you're on a drama and you're given a week with a big orchestra, I mean, in terms of budget, that's, right. and to be honest, you probably don't need it. So it's just about that. It's, it's, it's that sort of um, melting pot of, what do you need and then what's practical? What do you need dramatically and emotionally? And then what's actually practical for the filmmakers? What feature projects uh, are you excited about that we can look forward to seeing or hearing? I'm really excited about this beautiful Arabian animation that I'm, that I'm a part of, which is, uh, it's essentially a, a story of friendship between a boy and his, his dog, except it's, it's Saudi Arabia. So it's a boy and his camel. It's, it's, it's still in development, but I've, I've been, because I mean, animations, you'll often come on pretty early, start developing themes and they'll start carving out the, the space that they need for the music. So I started on that this year and uh, I'm really excited to see that. Cause that's, I mean, going back to our conversation about luck and, you know, composers are sort of judged by their projects, but you can't, you can't choose your projects and you can only, you know, you have to write the score that's best for the movie. And to be able to write a score like this, which is a sort of Lawrence of Arabia meets how to train a dragon is a real blessing. So I'm really excited for that and hope to really be able to show, show my, my best work on that. Oh, that does sound exciting. Yeah. Uh, what, can you say what studio that's through or is it hush hush? 
Uh, not at the moment. No. Okay. Yeah. All right. And where can people find you and follow you on the internet or social media? Uh, I have uh, Instagram uh, and uh, Twitter and Facebook. I have you know Facebook composer page, and I'm also on Spotify. Um, I was very lucky to have an album for the How to Train a Dragon holiday special put out on Spotify, which oh, is nice. yeah, it's got a lot of you know. I mean, John's score for the for all the How to Train a Dragon movies that I was lucky to be a part of the second two, um, but they're so incredible that they've generated this huge fan base for the franchise of, of people who really love that music as much as they love the movies in many ways. And so it was a real privilege to, to have an album out as well. And so those fans have sort of dived into that as well. And, you know, it's really cool to see a lot of play people add that to their how to train a dragon playlist. So, you know, that's being consumed and that's been a really nice way to get my name out there as well. Great. Well, I'll put links to all of those uh, sources on the show notes. Oh, and, awesome. uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Brian. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Dream Path Podcast. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. I appreciate your time. And as always, go find your dream path.